So my executive producer and I always enjoy behind the scenes looks at different YouTubers. Like it's always so interesting what cameras they use, how they record and edit their videos and all the other cool stuff that goes into producing videos. And although I'm more of a filthy casual YouTuber recording the occasional video in my spare bedroom, I still somehow find myself facing obstacles that many small to medium sized businesses do. Like how do I store the mountain of data I produce? How do I upload it to the cloud without spending a small fortune? And how do I back it all up? Not to mention, I also have to build stuff like this. So getting back to data, I, as well as my executive assistant, produce hundreds of gigabytes of data in footage, videos, and other things every week. And because I work with an editor located overseas, I have to not only store, organize, and back up this data, but also send it around the globe and back again. And if you've got tons of data or Maybe you're a YouTuber or small business owner, or maybe you're just interested in the behind the scenes of what goes into a YouTube channel. You might find this video interesting. And big thanks to Synology for reaching out and sponsoring this video and asking me to talk about all of this data stuff. So this is my NAS or Network Attached Storage Device. It's essentially a big hard drive with, uh, this particular one has about 50 terabytes of total combined storage capacity. And this is essentially the hub of my entire YouTube channel slash business. Like everything goes on here and anyone can access it from anywhere in the world. Now the rest of this stuff is my home network. So if you do want a video on that, uh, let me know down in the comments below. So recording a typical YouTube video can take some time as you might expect. I mean, once you factor in all the B-roll and talking headshots, the project is somewhere around 100 to 150 gigabytes in size typically. Triple that if I pull out the big boy black magic camera. Once I'm done recording, I pretty much just pop out all of the SD cards and dump all of the footage onto my NAS. At that point, it starts uploading to a NAS I also bought my editor. And within a few hours, all of that footage is sitting on his NAS on the other side of the world and he can just start editing. Pretty sweet, right? And some people will just say that you know, I should use Google Drive or Dropbox, for example, but I don't wanna pay for that because I'm a cheap ass and it still doesn't solve the issue of having all of this data locally for everyone, which is the main goal of this setup. Now, I can't make a video like this without going into the process of buying and building your own NAS. Now, you can go fully custom and open source and use an old PC paired with a NAS software like TrueNAS, or you can go for a more proprietary but more user-friendly option like Synology, which I obviously decided to go with. Now, full disclaimer, I did go with Synology years before they reached out to sponsor this video. In fact, they saw previous videos I made featuring their gear and that's how they found me. So this video is still 100% based on my own opinions and experience over the last couple of years. That being said, if you do decide to go with a Synology NAS, a big drawback in my opinion is that their hardware is a bit overpriced and it's not really powerful either compared to some of the competitors. I mean, QNAP, for example, is another popular company that sells NAS hardware, and I almost went with one of their solutions. But the big reason I decided on Synology in particular is because of their software, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Now, my main Synology NAS is not quite plug and play. I went with a DS1821 Plus enclosure, which can hold up to eight drives, and I ended up filling these slots with some 16 terabyte drives from Seagate. If you are interested in buying your own Synology NAS, I'll provide some links in the description with the best pricing I could find, as well as any current discounts or sales. Now, in addition to that, you can also choose to add or upgrade certain components. For example, adding more RAM, I personally went with 32 gigabytes uh, or a network card for 10 gigabit ethernet connectivity and even an SSD cache, which is great if you work with small individual files like photos. Now, if I had to choose just one upgrade, I would definitely go for the network card. I mean, without it, you are capped at read and write speeds from your NAS of one gigabit, which is around 110 megabytes per second, which is you know, don't get me wrong, totally fine for transferring the occasional file, but not so great for dumping huge amounts of data or editing footage directly off the NAS, which I personally do. Now, a 10 gigabit ethernet card gives you, like the name suggests, 10 gigabit speeds. And 
Realistically, you can expect to achieve around 500 to 700 megabytes per second read and write speeds, depending on the speed of your individual NAS setup. Now, I also purchased a smaller version of my main NAS, the DS923 Plus, and shipped it to my editor along with some upgrades like an SSD cache and network card. And this is where the real magic of this setup happens. Synology uses something called Disk Station Manager. It's essentially the operating system of the NAS, like Mac OS for Macs or Windows for PCs. Now I could make a whole separate video on DSM because it basically does everything for you automatically updates, tests my hard drives for corrupted data and health once a month, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And just like macOS, it has an app store where you can download different apps, although Synology calls their version Package Center. Now, the one app that was a complete game changer for me was Synology Drive ShareSync. Now, I'm gonna skip all of the technical jargon and try to explain this as simply as possible. So, ShareSync essentially enables a two-way sync between two different NASs. For example, if I put a file on my NAS, it uploads and downloads to my editor's NAS via Synology's Quick Connect protocol. If my editor deletes something or changes a file, that also reflects on my NAS. So we are essentially sharing the same huge hard drive, even though we're both on different sides of the planet. I'm in Australia and he's in Europe. It's actually very similar to how Google Drive and Dropbox works, but on a much bigger scale. I mean, we're currently sharing about 15 terabytes of archived videos and footage, and all of this is accessible locally, even without internet, because it's you know physically on the NAS hard drives, not up in the cloud. But just like Dropbox or Google Drive, for example, I can still go back in time and access modified or deleted files, even if they are hundreds of gigabytes in size. And I can do this via an app called Snapshot Replication. And if you're familiar with Time Machine for Mac, it's kind of the same, but better in my opinion. To explain what it does, it's really all in the name. I mean, it takes a snapshot or an image of a folder automatically at a time you can specify. Then if anything happens to your data, like you accidentally delete something or a file gets corrupted, you can either roll the whole folder back or just access an older snapshot to get an individual file. I have my folders set up like this. I can access the last 72 hours of hourly snapshots or even go all the way back to eight weeks in case it takes me a while to notice something missing or corrupted. Now you have full control over this by the way, unlike Dropbox or Google Drive. So if you wanted, you could set it up so that you have access to files that were deleted years ago. Now snapshot replication is cool, but properly backing up terabytes of data is another thing altogether. I mean, I have years of data on this thing that I do not want to lose. And you might've heard of the three, two, one rule for backup. So three copies of your data on two different media types with one copy being in a different location. Now, there's a few options here. I started out by using a website called Backblaze, which is essentially a big hard drive for backups in the cloud. Uh, you can't easily access your files on Google Drive, it just stores backups. Synology actually has their own version of this called C2 Cloud, which is more expensive than Backblaze, but it integrates really easily into your NAS and was really easy to set up. Also, you can just jump onto the C2 web portal and access individual files if you want. Now, that being said, I stopped using cloud-based backups altogether about a year ago because I worked out in the long run, it would be cheaper for me because I have so much data to buy another NAS, set it up at my parents' house and use an app called Hyper Backup to archive and backup all the data on my main NAS to this offsite backup NAS. Again, you can just download the Hyper Backup app on Disk Station Manager and be up and running within a few minutes. It's super easy. Now, if you're a small business, you can also pair this with something like Active Backup for Business, which allows your entire team to back up their computers to one home base NAS, which can also be offsite for better data protection. Now, for me personally, I don't use any fancy backup systems. I just keep all of the files on my computer stored on my NAS instead and not locally on my SSD. So if anything happens to my laptop, like it gets stolen or you know explodes in a fire or something, 
I can be back up and running with all of my data within a few hours. So yeah, that is a behind the scenes look at my YouTube data solution for both storing files and backing them all up without being locked into expensive subscription fees from Google Drive or Dropbox. And look, I am not gonna lie here, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. It does take a lot of trial and effort to get the hang of everything and find out all the things you need to know to make this work. But once you have it up and running, trust me, it is great.